we're really excited to have you all with us and particularly to have uh, Dr. Ron Siegel joining us today um, for what promises to be a really uh, informative and, and exciting session. And so just to begin, for anyone who's been on webinars with us before, as you'll know, um, I'm just going to open up with a short presentation just to introduce uh, MMA for anyone who's new um, and where everything's at, and then I'll pass it over uh, to Dr. Siegel um, for his talk. And so to begin with, to set the scene, um, just to open up the conversation of the mental health epidemic that we have in Australia, um, as, as many on this call will know, um, the mental health statistics in Australia really aren't great. Uh, one in five Australian adults had a chronic mental illness before COVID-19. One in seven Australians are now on antidepressants. Um, and as you can see here, that includes up to one in 30 children and one in four older people. Uh, there's massive costs associated with this, um, importantly to human life and to the potential of uh, those people who are suffering. But in addition to that, there's also um, enormous financial costs to society. And what we've seen um, over the last few years since we started My Medicine Australia is that government and peak body responses have been, been slow and incremental. Um, although obviously, as we'll discuss um, in a moment, there's been some change, important change that we've seen earlier this year. And so as you can see at the bottom here, despite the best efforts of clinicians, we're just not seeing great, great outcomes. The elephant in the room, as we like to say, is the lack of treatment effectiveness and the lack of innovation in treatment. There's been minimal change uh, in innovation over 50 years through the pharmacological treatments that are available. And we see low remission rates for things like depression and PTSD, um, high relapse rates of addiction. And when we look at eating disorders, really, really substantial treatment challenges. Um, and so a more of the same approach really doesn't look like it's gonna uh, change those statistics that I just spoke of. And there really is change that's needed. And so this is why Mind Medicine Australia was founded about four and a half years ago. It's a charity focused on alleviating suffering through new treatment uh, innovation and new treatment approaches, looking at the whole system. Um, our primary focus so far um, and currently is on bringing psychedelic assisted therapies into the health system in a controlled way. And as you can see here, there's a specific focus on psilocybin, MDMA and ketamine, as these are the uh, medicines that have the, the, the best evidence to support their use. And the ind indications of success are that these therapies were aiming to become an integral part of our mental health system, achieving high remission rates, leading to a substantial improvement of those statistics that I mentioned earlier, and that they're accessible and affordable to all Australians in need, regardless of their financial um, situation and regardless of where they live. And so we aim to achieve this through four strategic areas. The first of these is awareness and knowledge of build building. Four and a half years ago, this is something that we had to focus on a lot because the awareness of these therapies was much lower. Um, but then over the last few years, as things are developing, we've been putting increasing energy into these other pillars, which include a professional development program, which is now in its third year of our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies course, um, supporting research. Um, there was a $15 million grant from the Australian government that was passed out last year that came from advocacy we did in Canberra. We helped to found the Neuromedicines Discovery Center at Monash, at Monash University, sorry. Um, there's three trials in progress, which we've helped to fund. Um, and finally, patient access. Um, and in that, we're trying to support medicine availability and cost-effectiveness um, to tackle the affordability challenges that exist around these therapies. Um, and perhaps most importantly, at this point in time, supporting regulatory change. Um, key to this is the rescheduling, which was recently announced. Um, and as you can see on this slide, the rescheduling of MDMA and psilocybin, um, which comes into effect from July 1st, is, has been a world first, the first country in Australia that has um, made that scheduling change and recognized these two substances as, as medicines. And this is something that's really exciting and a really promising development. But as it says at the bottom of this slide, there is a heavy obligation on Australia to get this right. We need to be careful and considered in our approach as we look to implement the uh, authorised prescriber scheme that the TGA has put forth um, so that we can begin the integration of these therapies into our uh, medical system in a way that is works really well and leads to really good and promising patient outcomes. And so finally, before I pass over to Ron, just to cover a couple of things that we have happening at MMA um, and how you can be involved. One is our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. Our 2023 program is starting in mid-July. We're running the final interviews uh, this and next week. Um, and so 
If anyone does want to try to sneak into those last interviews, if you'd like to reach out in the next day or so, the, the window is, is closing very quickly, but touch base if you'd like to try to jump in on there and see if you can join in, uh, in this year's cohort. Otherwise, we will be running again next year. And something that we're really excited to be just announcing just this week is a supervision program for graduates of the course. We feel that supervision is a really important um, piece uh, in psychedelic assisted therapies going forward, giving opportunities for, uh, for people who are working in this field to have ongoing guidance and mentoring from leaders in the field. Uh, and as you can see here, the supervisors that we've uh, got who've joined this program, um, Dr. Bill Richards, Ben Sessa, Lauren McDonald, and Sarah Reid, who are both working at Imperial College in London, and Dr. Brian Richards, who's actually Bill's son, really are five, five people who have incredible experience, and we're really excited that they'll be helping to guide clinicians in Australia as they start to work in this field. And finally, how can you help? Um, a key thing is to be informed. Thank you all for joining the session today um, as a part of that, um, but keep 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 up to date with everything that's happening and with the information in this fast developing field. Um, sharing that awareness as you build it is an incredible thing that you can do to keep building that awareness collectively so that we can uh, understand what's happening and um, what we can all do to be a part of it. Um, we are a charity, so donating and helping to fundraise is really helpful so that we can continue to do the work that we're doing. And volunteering, uh, and that includes joining our chapters, which we have around Australia, which are volunteer groups, uh, is a great way to, to be involved. And so with that, that brings us to the end of my introductory presentation. And so I'm extremely, extremely pleased to be able to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Ron Siegel, he's an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. Um, and importantly, and significantly, as many know, he's a longtime student of mindfulness and meditation. He serves on the board of directors and faculty of the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy. Uh, he teaches internationally about the application of mindfulness practice in psychotherapy and other fields, and he also works in private practice. Uh, he's a highly acclaimed author, uh, having written several books, and his latest book, which is called The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary, Finding Happiness Right Where You Are, I think we're going to hear a lot more about some of the ideas that are in that today. And finally, um, obviously, as psychedelic assisted therapy is a key part of the work that we do, uh, Dr. Siegel is also well versed in that area. Uh, he serves as a mentor at the California Institute of Integral Studies in their program in psychedelic assisted therapy and is also a co-director of the annual Harvard Medical School conferences in meditation and psychotherapy, but also for their conference in psychedelic assisted therapy. And so with no further ado, I'm extremely pleased to introduce Dr. Ron Siegel. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Scott, for that lovely introduction and for uh, keeping people appraised of what uh, um, MMA is, is up to. And uh, just a little pitch I happen to uh, be friends with or know as close colleagues and quite a number of people on the faculty, both the supervisors and, and of the main program. And uh, those are great people to be learning this from. They're, they're re they really are pioneers and leaders in the field. Uh, so you. thanks. Yeah, so so thanks so much for having me. I um, uh, I've only been to Australia a couple of times, but I have uh, um, just great affection for your uh, for your people and culture. So it's a real treat to be able to uh, uh, share some of these uh, themes with you. Um, I, I want to give you the um, the backstory uh, to uh, this talk and actually to the to the book that Scott mentioned, which is um, a number of years ago. Uh, I found myself in my um, well, early to mid 60s and having spent some four plus decades involved in uh, mindfulness practices, largely in Buddhist traditions, and four plus decades working as a clinical psychologist, having been in my own therapy and doing all sorts of, of self-exploration. And uh, you would have thought that the result of all of that might have been to develop something like a secure, coherent, um, comfortable sense of self. But if I were really honest with myself, and I tried to be, I discovered, nope, hasn't happened. I was still finding that my feelings about myself were going up and down based on the vicissitudes of the day. You know, I'd have a really good psychotherapy session that was really connected and felt meaningful and useful. And I think, God, all these years of, of practice and self-exploration and clinical training, they're really paying off. I'm really skilled at this. And isn't this wonderful? And then I'd have a session that didn't go well, where I wasn't connecting, I wasn't getting traction. And I'd start to think, 
I was a good student. I could have gone into so many fields. This is clearly not my calling. And when I started looking around and looking at my caseload, I realized that it wasn't just me, that you know, virtually all the people that I was working with were struggling with more or less two states of mind. And some would be more stuck in one or the other. One state of mind would be mm, feeling somehow not good enough, feeling somehow not living up to potential, not living up to expectations, not living up to some inner standard and, and feeling inadequate or insecure that way. Or the other side of it, being basically stressed out, trying to stay on top of their game, stressed out, trying to feel like, you know, yeah, look at, you know, I'm achieving this, I'm achieving that. Um, people respect me and you know, living up to some kind of internal standard. And what was interesting was that the criteria, the standards that people were holding themselves to were quite diverse. My, I had my particular ones, my, my uh, clients had their own, but to be concerned with this, to be concerned with this kind of social comparison, that seemed pretty much universal. And it set me on a bit of a quest because after all, you know, in Buddhist traditions, one of the ideas, in fact, the central idea is to not be so self-preoccupied, right? To somehow transcend a sense of ego, transcend preoccupation with social judgment and social comparison and all of that kind of thing. And to be able to experience ourselves as being, you know, part of nature, part of common humanity, uh, part of the universe. And yet, despite a lot of practice, those kinds of experiences were coming and going, and they were certainly alternating with a lot of these other feelings. So I, I set out on a little bit of a project to see, number one, what's up with this? You know, maybe it's just, you know, my own trauma history, you know, being picked last for, uh, you know, kickball games in the third grade, and maybe I've just never gotten over it. Or maybe there's something more universal here. And if we can tap into what's more universal and maybe come up with some principles about how to work with this, maybe we could all get a bit freer. And the connection between this and psychedelics is actually a very intimate one, because one of the things that happens as part of psychedelic journeys, and we'll talk more about this um, going forward, is people very often have what are called transpersonal or mystical experiences, which are these experiences of feeling not like a separate individual, but feeling at least part of common humanity, if not part of all, all creation. So the thought was, well, what happens? I'd had plenty of those experiences myself, both on the cushion doing meditation practice, as well as in psychedelic journeying, but yet the old preoccupations would arise in, uh, in, in new situations. So, so what I want to talk to you about today is what are these transpersonal experiences and what might we do to help make them more a part of our lives, which is really part of the broad integration project that we have with uh, with psychedelic work. Most of you are probably aware that there are basically three phases. There's preparation before engaging in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. There's a medicine session itself, one, two, three, or more. And then there's the integration phase, which is how do we make a life that's that manifests what we've learned, the insights that we've gained during the medicine session. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about with, a, with an, an emphasis on the transpersonal part. And what I'm going to ask of you first is if you're not involved in some kind of illegal or otherwise nefarious activity, turn on your video camera. Because one, one of the things we're going to be talking about is developing a sense of common humanity, which actually comes from uh, developing a sense of community and noticing what we have in common. And we're going to do some exercises together. And I want us to be able to uh, to see one another uh, when this happens. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It seems like many people are involved in legal pursuits, which is deeply reassuring. Um, so let me uh, share some slides with you. <laughs> yeah, I like the... Uh, um, uh, Marianne, I, I appreciate the upside down look. It adds it, it, it adds an interesting kind of variety to the to the whole look. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Upside. Well, you know, for me, Australia, it makes sense you'd be upside down, right? So let me uh, share some slides with you. Uh, and let me make it so I can also see you guys and women. Thank you.
Um, okay. So the first question is why? How come so many of us spend so much time trying to live up to some kind of inner standard and feeling either, yay, I'm doing well and feeling good about ourselves or feeling inadequate in some way? And I propose to you it's Darwin's fault, not literally Darwin, but it's the fault of natural selection. Uh, I had the privilege of um, going on a so-called uh, safari uh, in the African savanna some years ago, which means riding around in a Jeep with a naturalist. And the naturalist pointed out the same pattern in species after species. There would be a dominant male surrounded by literally a harem of reproductively promising females. And then over in the next field, there would be a group of other, usually males, a bit younger, doing the species-specific equivalent of playing football, trying to develop the skills to become dominant. And you see this in so many different species, including so many different primate species. And the question is, why? What's up with that? We see it in birds. We have the English expression pecking orders, right, to, to describe this. And in fact, we apply the same term to, um, uh, to uh, relationships among hierarchical relationships among humans. And there are species of crickets that if you put them in a box inside of literally a few seconds, they'll organize themselves into a dominance hierarchy. And it turns out that kids, if you take uh, uh, human children by the age of four, they'll organize themselves into what are called transitive dominance hierarchies. That means if uh, Julio uh, gets it, that he can kind of lord it over Sally, and Sally gets it that she can kind of lord it over Jim, Jim gets it that he's got to kowtow to Julio, right? That, that they, They're called transitive in the sense of uh, from uh, mathematics, from algebra, if A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, you know that A is bigger than C. So humans are extremely, extremely sensitized to this kind of thing and start to make these kinds of social comparisons and comparisons about dominance all the time. Now, luckily, we also have other instincts. We have instincts toward cooperation, instincts toward love and the like, but interestingly, they are easily trumped, pun intended, by these kinds of issues, by these kinds of uh, concerns with how am I doing? And the really interesting thing is in human, in, in we hum, in us human beings, you know, it's not usually we're literally going like this and trying to dominate one another, or the, although that certainly does happen, but the much more common thing that happens is we start to make comparisons in our own minds between us and other people. We start to be involved in either feeling good about ourselves or not good about ourselves based on these social comparisons. And that shows up as what we call self-esteem. And for humans, these feelings of either feeling good about ourselves or not good about ourselves are really remarkably powerful for shaping our lives, shaping our behavior, and frankly, getting in the way of our happiness. So what I'd like to do with you now is a bit of an exercise that I invite you to join me in. And uh, it looks like um, most of you are not driving automobiles, so you'll be able to uh, close your eyes for this one, which will be helpful. And uh, what I'm going to invite you to do is explore some of the areas of social comparison that typically engage other people. And there's gonna be a little bit of a meditation exercise. And I want you to just notice if any of these have ever been relevant to you, have any of these ever felt salient, have they ever rang a bell? So take a moment to close your eyes. And let's just start with taking a breath or two so you can notice, notice what you're experiencing inside. And sense what's happening in your body, because your body is going to give you the, the answers to these questions. Um, and we're going to start with skills and talents. And all I want you to do is notice whether, yeah, whether any of these concerns have ever felt alive to you. We'll start with intelligence. Have you ever had feelings about being smart enough, or who's smarter, or feeling smarter or less smart than another person? 
who are closely related, education. Ever have thoughts about who's more educated or am I educated enough? Creativity, am I creative enough? Talented, feelings about being talented enough or having good taste in the aesthetic sense. Or how about athletics? Maybe this was when you were younger. Ever have feelings about being good enough in sports? Or who's better than whom? Then check out accomplishments. Have you ever had feelings about who earns more money and whether I earn enough? Or getting respect, am I respected enough? Do others get more respect? If you, have, if you happen to be a parent, you ever have feelings about who has the better looking, better behaved or more successful children? Feelings about whether your kids are doing well enough? If you happen to have a partner, ever have feelings about who has the better looking, better behaved or more successful partner? Is my partner good enough? Or am I successful enough at work? And then there's the judgments we have about group membership. Do I come from a good enough family? Did I go to a good enough college or university? Who has more friends? Who's more liked? Am I well liked? Do you ever have feelings about being part of the in crowd or not? Or attention? Feelings about, do I get enough attention? Do people pay enough attention to me? or your identity? How have you felt about your race, your ethnicity, your gender or sexual orientation? Have you felt proud or ashamed? A lot of us judge ourselves in terms of our role in relationships. Have I been a good enough friend? Am I a good enough parent? Have I been a good enough child? Sibling, coworker, just notice if these kinds of judgments have ever had juice for you, have ever affected you emotionally. And then there's our adherence to values. Who's nicer? Am I nice enough? Am I honest enough? Am I as generous as I should be? As caring? As forgiving? Am I socially aware enough, attuned to justice and, and injustice? Or are others more attuned to me? Am I kind of out of it there? And of course, physical qualities. Ever have feelings about being attractive enough? Who's thinner? Am I thin enough? Who's taller? Am I tall enough? Am I sexy enough? Do I look young enough? Or who's stronger or in better shape? Am I fit enough? And among those of us who are invested in spiritual or psychological development, whether through meditation or psychedelics or another pathway, even sillier items show up on the list. Who's more enlightened or more holy? Who makes fewer social comparisons is less driven by ego? Who's less concerned with self-evaluation? Am I too preoccupied with myself? And now what I'd like you to do is to just select one of those items that felt like it was kind of alive to you. That, oh yeah, this one rang a bell. It had some feeling. And I want you to remember or even imagine a time when that quality or that attribute was validated. Like if it's intelligence, it would be a time when, yeah, you felt, you felt pretty smart, maybe because other people saw you that way, or maybe just because you felt that way yourself. If it was kindness, a time when you felt like, yeah, I really was kind, whatever it might be. And just imagine or remember that time and notice what it feels like in the body. Notice what it feels like to feel good about yourself and maybe even exaggerate the physical posture of it. Like, you know, what's this posture like? How does it feel to be 
feeling good about yourself. And maybe even put your hand over the part of your body where that's most alive, where you can feel it. And just breathe with that and enjoy that, that kind of self-esteem boost. Enjoy the feeling for a moment. Because it's not going to last. Because next I want you to recall or imagine a time where the opposite happened. Where in the very same realm, you felt like you weren't cutting it. You weren't good enough. Somehow others were better than you and you felt like you weren't living up to your, your goals or your expectations. And maybe exaggerate that posture. What was that like? And place your hand over the part of your body where you feel that. And just feel the pain of the self-esteem collapse for a moment. Don't worry, that's not going to last either. So now come back to a neutral posture and just your breath for a few moments. And allow yourself to open your eyes and come back into the group. Thank you for doing this. And now I have a question for us. And um, just answer, you don't have to use the Zoom techniques. You can actually physically raise your hand if this is true. We can, we can see one another. Physically raise your hand if at least one of those criteria or attributes rang a bell for you. Like, oh yeah, this, this has mattered to me at some point in my life. This is, you know, yeah, I, 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 I know what he's talking about. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for your honesty too. Um, and now raise your hand if actually more than one was salient, more than one rang a bell and you thought, yeah, yeah, those are, yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, me too. And uh, now raise your hand if like most of them were salient, that it's at one point or another, you felt that most of them were. That's not unusual, right? And that's really good news because one, one of the ways that we actually can start freeing ourselves from this is to begin to notice what it's like and notice that we're not, that we are in this together. And my second question for you is, raise your hand if you notice that the self-esteem boost felt pretty good and the self-esteem collapse felt pretty bad. You notice a, a difference in how they felt? Yeah, most of us don't have a lot of trouble accessing that. Now, it's interesting. In the world of, of clinical psychology, whenever there's a really strong contrast between something that feels good and something that feels bad, it's a territory where it is really, really easy to get addicted. Really, really easy to get addicted. Think crack cocaine, for example. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but the reports are that when you smoke crack, you feel really, really good for a little while. And when it wears off, you feel really, really bad. And there's a very strong temptation to do what? To smoke more crack cocaine, right? To start feeling better again. Well, unfortunately, that's the way it works for us too. We very easily become addicted to pursuing self-esteem highs. I couldn't believe it. I was flying on Lufthansa um, not long ago and I saw that their, their, um, uh, their logo was nonstop you, right? It was, it was as though they were selling like self-esteem highs, just fly on, on, uh, on Lufthansa. And uh, what happens to, to many of us is we'll have a moment in which we start to feel crappy about ourselves. We start to feel like we're not doing so well and our minds start to scramble. How do I, you know, how do I get it back? How do I get my mojo back? How do I get this feeling back? And we do all sorts of different things uh, to, to try to feel better, but they tend not to work very well. Uh, and there's two reasons why we can't win at this game. We simply cannot win at the game of trying to be special, trying to be good enough, trying to live up to all of these different standards. The first one is what we might call narcissistic recalibration. And the, the problem here is that things that once floated our boat don't do it anymore. Um, you have in Australia this um, children's toy 
in which there are multicolored rings, either out of wood or out of uh, plastic that have a hole in them and there's a pole. And the object of the game is to arrange them so that they look like a cone or a Christmas tree. Is that the, a kid's game there? Yes, yeah, so I, I think that's <laughs> that made its way around the world a lot. Remember as a little kid, doing that and getting, hey, look, mommy, look, daddy, I could do it, right? But it doesn't float our boat so much anymore. Same thing with, you know, learning to walk, riding a bike, going to the store alone. Remember your first girlfriend or boyfriend when somebody who you like liked you back? Wow, that felt good. Um, you know, I, I often do um, workshops for mental health professionals. And, uh, you know, most mental health professionals they worked really hard to get their terminal degree, right? It, you know, it takes years, you know, many years to get a doctorate, long enough to get a master's degree. And uh, usually when people got those degrees at that moment, they felt really great. Like, hey, I finally made it. So I'll ask a group, I might have, I don't know, 100 mental health professionals in the room. And I'll say, how many of you woke up this morning feeling really good about yourself because you had your terminal degree? And sometimes like one newly minted therapist will raise their hand and they'll say, why is everybody laughing? Because the rest of the group is cracking up as though this is like completely absurd. The problem is we habituate to absolutely everything. Even if we're an Olympic gold medalist, so, sorry, um, we habituate to everything. So then we need more and more. The other problem that we have um, is the impossibility of winning consistently. Even if we're an Olympic gold medalist and we really have won the gold, like we're totally at the top of our game, what are the chances of being at the top of our game in four years? What are the chances in eight years? And we see this all the time. We start to develop different comparison groups so that, you know, yeah, you know, at one point it might have been really cool to be uh, in a certain position, but then we start to compare ourselves to other people in that position. And it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's buying a house, getting a car, having a child, getting married, you know, all of these things, we then start to change our comparison group and we can't win at this. The other serious problem we have um, is that we wind up investing in stuff that are just so, so impermanent. Um, uh, Joseph Campbell, the, uh, the student of the world's mythologies, um, he famously said, many people climb the ladder of success only to discover that it was leaning up against the wrong wall, right? That, uh, you know, we get to these things, but they don't work anymore. Um, there was a, uh, a, an economist you may be familiar with named uh, Thurston Veblen, and he in 1899 wrote a book called The uh, uh, the theory of the leisure class. And it turned out that my dad um, taught economics. So I had the experience of being in suburban New York and as a little kid, maybe age nine or 10, and somebody drove by in a Cadillac, which in those days in America was a luxury car. And my dad said to me, oh, that's a Cadillac. That's what's called a status symbol. And Thurston Veblen wrote this book and coined the term conspicuous consumption, which is when we buy stuff in order to be able to show people we can buy stuff, right? And many of us may think, well, I'm not shallow like that. But you dig in a little bit and you discover, well, there's something or another gets all of us. And, you know, the marketers know this, you know, the, um, uh, I, I fly around a bit uh, on airplanes to, um, uh, to do workshops and the like, and at least in the States, they have these complex hierarchies by which the order in which people get on the airplane. Okay, first they start with the first class and business class, they paid an ungodly amount for the ticket. That's understandable. Um, but then we start with the executive platinum plus passengers, followed by the platinum passengers, followed by the gold and the silver. And God forbid we should be one of the eight lumpen proletariats slinking on the plane at low status at the end. Now, what's up with this? This is all selling this kind of status. And all of this has just gotten way worse, way worse with um, social media. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't see many internet posts where the person says, you know, on Instagram or Facebook or something, woke up this morning, had the runs again, anxious that my girlfriend's going to leave me and my boss is going to give me a crappy review, right? No, it's like, here I am at a fantastic place 
doing fantastic things with fantastic people in a highly curated fashion, and you're not here. That's what people are communicating to one another. So this is now a, you know, a horrible epidemic among younger people in particular who are more social media embedded of always feeling inadequate in some way. So this is to lay out the problem. There's a classic thing that advertisers do, which is they say they lay out the problem and then, hey, here's the answer. Okay, well, hey, here's the answer. Transpersonal awareness is actually a useful antidote to this. And it's something that can um, that can help us to uh, to get some freedom from this. And as it turns out, psychedelics can help. Um, I'm uh, since I'm here in uh, in the Boston area at, at Harvard, um, I will recount uh, the Good Friday experiment in 1962. Those of you who are in the psychedelic world will be familiar with this, where um, a fellow by the name of Walter Panke, who was a um, conventionally trained uh, uh, Harvard uh, psychiatrist, who also had gotten a master's in divinity at Harvard, and he's working on his PhD. And in 1962, he joined two rather renegade uh, psychologists at the time, uh, Tim Leary and, and Richard Albert, who were involved in the Harvard Psilocybin Project. And he did an experiment that's now called the Good Friday Experiment. And what he did was he uh, got a bunch of uh, theology students and asked them to bring sacred objects or sacred texts and to show up at uh, this chapel in, in downtown Boston on Good Friday in 1962. And he gave half of them psilocybin and half of them a placebo. And he saw what happened. He also developed something called the Mystical Experience Questionnaire, which actually is used today to measure mystical experiences in, uh, in psychedelic work. And um, mysticism is, is defined by having a sense of internal unity, meaning basically accepting all the different parts of ourselves and feeling coherent in this way. External unity, a sense of oneness with other human beings in the outer world. Having a noetic quality, which means it feels true. It just feels true what I'm experiencing. A sense of sacredness, positive mood, transcendence of time and space, and ineffability. And guess what? Panke found that almost all of these theology students had these profound mystical experiences. And in fact, Rick Doblin, who's well known in the United States as the really the, um, the, the leader of getting uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy mainstreamed and he's orchestrated the FDA trials and all that. Uh, Rick did his doctoral dissertation, tracking down these theology students like 15, 20 years later to ask them what their memory was of the Good Friday experiment. And the majority of them said, well, it was the most meaningful experience of my life. So this is, this is, this is interesting, uh, the potential of psychedelics to do this. And we find in most disorders that psychedelics are helpful in treating, not so much in PTSD, which is interesting. That's a side discussion maybe we'll get into in the Q&A. But in most of them, the degree to which people have a transpersonal experience actually gives this, um, actually is quite um, uh, correlates to the degree to which they have clinical improvement. So let's dig in a little bit more to what these um, transpersonal experiences are, are, lot, are about and what we can do to harness them and particularly to integrate them after they occur. One of the interesting things we find in meditation practice is try as we might, we, it's very hard to find me or I. And let's do a really quick little experiment so that you can have a taste of this. I invite you to close your eyes again and take a couple of breaths. And I want you to just slowly count from one to five, just slowly and silently in your silently count from one to five. Very good. And now keeping your eyes closed, I invite you to again count silently from one to five and see if you can locate where in your body or in space the counting is occurring.
Okay, very good. And take a note of that. And now I want you to again count from one to five and see if you can locate where the me or the I is, the volitional entity that is doing the counting. We say, I count, I just counted from one to five. See if you can find the I and just count slowly and see if you can find where that's located. And then finally, I invite you to again count from one to five silently and see if you can identify the me or the I that's observing the counting. And if this is beginning to feel a little confusing, that's kind of the idea that usually what happens when we do this, you can open your eyes again, is, well, we can sort of locate where the counting is happening. But the me or the I that's doing the counting, that becomes a little bit more difficult to identify. And one of the interesting things we, we find in, in both meditative practices and in psychedelic work is hmm, when we start to really inquire, even though we're always talking to ourselves about ourselves, this self can be kind of hard to find. So how can we use this insight? to free ourselves from, from self-preoccupation and all the pain that it begins. And I'm gonna suggest a three H approach. Basically, this stuff is so deeply embedded in us. It's so embedded in our biology because there was reproductive advantage, unfortunately, to coming out on top in these dominance hierarchies. You know, the, the dominant males had a better chance of reproducing with these reproductively promising females delivering resources to the kids and protecting those kids. So our brains evolve to have a strong preoccupation with social comparison and to be constantly scanning for how do we compare to others. And our societies evolve to do this so that every time we sell anything to anybody, we're almost always doing it by suggesting subtly or overtly, hey, your social status will go up if you buy this product. You know, it was Thorsten Veblen, the, you know, the idea of conspicuous consumption, that's everywhere, right? Buy this and you'll look like this person in this fancy sports car with this beautiful other person that they're with, et cetera. So being that it's so strongly reinforced by our cultures and very often by our parents and teachers, and it's biological, we kind of have to work to integrate the insights that we might get in meditation practice or or psychedelics in order to make this come more alive. And we have to work at three levels with our heads, our hearts, and our habits. How do we work with our heads? Well, it starts by catching ourselves in the act. The little exercise that we did before of just going through the different criteria that we use to evaluate ourselves begins to sensitize us to this. I'm gonna venture to predict that if you wind up remembering this little webinar, tomorrow you're gonna to start noticing a little bit more when you go up and when you go down, when the things that are hooking you, the, you know, what are the criteria I'm using now? What's making me feel good or not so good about ourselves? And you can also actually turn this into an exercise. You can write a self-esteem autobiography. And the way that we do this is by going through your life and taking note of what were the moments that made you feel good and what were the moments that made you feel not so good. So we can even, we can even sort of start this together and just take a moment to reflect and think, so what was the first time in my life that I can remember kind of a self-esteem boost, feeling good about myself? I'll, I'll share mine. Mine was uh, it's a memory of being a, a little kid. My dad was an educator and I had used some kind of big or sophisticated word. And I could see he was really proud because, you know, when a little kid uses a big word, that's kind of like a big deal for somebody who's into words and education. And I remember getting it that, oh, this is something good and I should do more of this. And somehow it makes me feel good about myself. And once you locate that, then take a moment to reflect. Can you remember your first self-esteem crash, the first moment of feeling like mm, there was something wrong with you or you weren't good enough? 
And for me, that was, uh, I was probably about age three and going to, we called it nursery school here. It's now called preschool in the States, but um, maybe I was four and it was my birthday. And my mom had sent me in with one of those strings of lollipops, you know, where they're connected by the cellophane. I don't know if you had candy that way, but that's how we had it here. And, uh, and I brought it in to celebrate my birthday with the rest of the class. And the teacher took one look at it and he said, well, this is a healthy nursery school. We don't eat things like that here. You'll have to send it home. You'll have to take it home. And just the collapse of, ooh, ooh, the pain of that. And the way you do a self-esteem autobiography is you just start looking, all right, what's my whole history of this? And you can go, you know, year by year, epoch by epoch, you know, what was it like when you're, you know, before elementary school? What was it in elementary school? What were you hooked on? And what we start to find is, oh, that's so interesting. I got hooked on being smart, you know, at age three or something. I'm still hooked on it now. I'm still trying to, you know, like establish that in my mind and feeling good about myself when I've got it and not so good about myself when I don't. The way we work with our hearts with this is by using either our meditation practice or our psychedelic practice to heal the past injuries. Because one of the problems, that one of the things that keeps us so addicted to these kinds of self-esteem projects is if we've had an experience in the past of an injury and something like that injury comes upon us now, it hurts doubly because it resonates with the past hurt. I have a, a patient or client who's an artist and he drew this picture. Uh, can you see the, the picture of the baseball? And you know, baseball, as you probably know, is pretty central to uh, American uh, children's culture. And it's just the picture of the baseball. And they said, I threw like a girl. And that as a, granted sexist, et cetera, but that as a thing that boys would say to one another, really, really, really painful. And you know he was he was sitting with this, and he he you know he managed to um, uh, to manifest it uh, in the painting. So what we want to do is we want to use our um, our practices to really visit the past hurts, because if we don't resolve the past hurts, we're always going to be we're always going to be compensating for them. We're always going to you know if I can't you know. Um, well, I'll give you a really quick example. So I, I was at a conference and I was with a lot of people who are prominent in my field. And it was nice to be invited to the conference and to participate. And there was this, you know, the speaker's uh, cocktail hour. And I just started getting the feeling that the really famous people in the group were kind of hanging out with one another and that I was in a second tier. And I started getting that self-esteem crash feeling. Uh, even though I had just been on a high giving a talk and having all sorts of people like it. So I asked myself, so what does this remind me of? And I started noticing, oh, I get it. Totally. I was a younger brother. My brother would be, you know, with his friends and they'd kind of tolerate me to sort of be nice, but also sort of put me down. And it felt like that. And when we can connect to the past injury, it gives us a chance to, to, look at the current injury in a fresh way. The other thing that the transpersonal perspective can do that is very, very powerful is help us to see our emotions a little bit differently, whether that be sadness, fear, anger, or even joy. Like, if I were to ask you right now to generate, close your eyes for a moment, and generate a little bit of sadness, not the saddest thing ever, but just generate a little bit of sadness. And see if you can feel where in your body you're experiencing that. And maybe put your hand over that area and even breathe with it. And just notice sadness as a sensation. And then generate a little bit of fear or anxiety and feel that in the body and notice where that lives and put your hand there so you can feel that. Just feel it as a body sensation. And then a bit of anger or annoyance. Where's that in the body? 
Can you feel that or breathe with that? If you're a very nice and spiritual person and you never feel angry, just think of somebody in the other political party, whoever that is, it'll help. And just breathe with the sensations of anger. And finally, joy. Let yourself breathe with and be with joy and notice where that is in the body. Maybe put your hand over the joy area. You can open your eyes again. And do you notice the way each of these emotions is primarily a somatic event? It's a sensation in the body with maybe a thought or an image accompanying it. Well, the more we hang out in a transpersonal space, the less we get attached to our narratives about emotions and the more we see them as unfolding moment to moment bodily experiences. So I'll, I'll show you how this can free us. Let, let's say it's anger. And let's say that, um, that uh, I have a friend and I think that I've been um, extraordinarily generous to this friend and he's done something selfish. And I get caught in a narrative. I can't believe you did that to me after all I've done for you. And every time I have that thought, the anger rises up in the body and I feel that. And every time my body gets aroused with the anger, it generates more of the thought. And that can turn into a recursive loop that can last for a few minutes, a few days, a few hours, a few decades, right? But if I'm hanging out in this more transpersonal space, and it is a mindfulness kind of space, I'll simply notice the anger rising in the body, maybe noticing images of decapitating the former friend dancing through the mind's eye. But I'll get it that it's all a kind of impersonal experience. And that makes it much, much easier to, um, uh, to, uh, to let it go. Okay, a couple more points. Um, I mean, there are many, many tools, but I'm, I, I'm just gonna, I wanna share two more that I think are um, particularly powerful. One of them is to cultivate self-compassion instead of self-esteem. Um, people who have studied self-compassion like Kristen Neff and my friend Chris Germer have pointed out that when things go wrong, when we mess up, when we fail, we get caught in this unholy trinity of self-criticism, self-isolation, and self-absorption. When we feel that we've really screwed up and we feel bad about ourselves, I talk to myself in a way I would never talk to a friend. You idiot, how could you have done that? If I talked to my friends that way, I wouldn't have any friends, right? None of us would. So we talk to ourselves harshly, we tend to withdraw from others, and we tend to get super absorbed in our reveries about how we've screwed up. The antidote is self-compassion, that instead of the self-criticism to generate some self-kindness, instead of isolating to see the common humanity that we all screw up, and to develop mindfulness instead of self-absorption. Let, let me give you a sense of how this would play out um, in a, um, with a child. Let's say your kid comes home from, they really, really wanted to make the football team at, uh, at school and they didn't make the cut and they're feeling really down on themselves. If you're gonna try to help them boost their self-esteem to feel better, you say, oh, well, Johnny, you know, I know you didn't make the football team, but remember in the fall, you played basketball and you're one of the star players and wow, you really nailed it on the mathletes. You know, you got to the regional championships. You're a great kid. You're smart, you're talented. Don't let this bother you, right? That's, that's how we reinvigorate self-esteem. If we were to try to instead help a kid develop self-compassion, we'd say, Oh, Johnny, I remember when I was around your age, I was really into drama and I so wanted to be part of the school play and I didn't make it. I didn't get chosen. And I was so discouraged. I felt like such a failure. I felt so sad about it. You know, we all win and we all lose. And it's super painful when we lose, but nobody can win all the time. I love you so much. Let me give you a hug. Feel the difference? You know, very different approach. Self-compassion is a really, really renewable resource that can help us through this. And there are all sorts of techniques that can help us connect with self-compassion, the simplest of which is simply imagining a friend who's wise and compassionate and imagine what they would say to us if we told them about our failure. And almost always we can come up with the friend saying, oh yeah, you know, we all make mistakes or 
I remember when that happened to me or, or this kind of thing. Because this presentation is going to be short and there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to get to, I want to give you a chance to get other materials if you want. But the trade-off is you have to give me your email address. Um, and there's a way for you to do that, which is to just send a blank email, okay, to handouts at yahoo.com. Okay, it's just handouts at yahoo.com. You can do it now from your computer or your phone. And just put in the subject line, Australia. And if you do it in the next several days, I'll know this is the only thing I'm doing in Australia. I'll know it's from here. So just blank email to handouts at yahoo.com. And I will send you... Um, I'll send you a chapter from the book. I'll send you an article about, I'll, I'll, I'll send you resources that are that let you dig in deeper. Okay, the last and most powerful thing we can do is to find a way to safely connect to others. There's a wonderful longitudinal study being done at Harvard. It's still going on. It's, it started in 1938, looking at what are the factors that cause psychological well-being and physical well-being and what are the factors that make people unhappy in life and the the jury's in we now know the answer the most important predictor of happiness and well-being mental and physical health is the quality of our relationships and these relationships don't have to be harmonious they could be bickering relationships they can be fooling around relationships but they have to be relationships in which we feel that others have our back and we have their back and one of the most powerful things about a transpersonal perspective is it helps us to connect to others because instead of judging others, instead of wondering how others are judging us, we learn how to make a connection, not an impression. And this is, you know, if you wanted a take home point, make a connection, not an impression is not a bad one because what would our days be like if instead of wondering about what people are thinking of us, how I'm doing, we just try to connect to other human beings. And the more we do this, the more life opens up, the more we feel a sense of joy. And the less we actually believe in our narratives about our, our separate self, the more we've actually got a transpersonal perspective where we realize we are all part of this human family. In fact, all part of the atoms and molecules of the universe, it's easier to make a connection, not an impression. It's not an accident that so many psychedelic experiences leave us, you know, outside the world of identities and and um, stories and social roles into a realm of love and connection. Another thing we can do is simply practice generosity. Every time that we do something generous, we get a little less self-preoccupied. Yeah, sometimes we're generous so we can think, hey, I'm a good person being generous. We're not going to get rid of that. But there's something about generosity that connects us to people. And there's something about gratitude that connects us to people. Because in a, in a moment when we're practicing gratitude with a gratitude journal or however we like to do it, we're actually connected to something other than ourselves because we're grateful to something or for something outside of ourselves, whether that be God, other humans, our parents, it's, it, it connects us to something larger. So I will leave you, we'll have a little bit of time for, for discussion. I'll leave you with a thought. This is from uh, uh, one of my favorite um, philosophers. He's a guy, um, he, he was actually a, a British uh, philosopher, but he masqueraded as a Taoist um, sage. And he wrote under the name of Wei Wu Wei. And he said, why are you unhappy? Because 99.9% .9 of everything you think and everything you do is for yourself. And there isn't one. And <laughs> to the extent to which we can see this, we're going to be better off. Um, the book, if you're interested, I'll send you a link to it, is again, uh, thank you, Scott. You mentioned it, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Happiness. And I'll just leave the slide up for, um, uh, for a few moments of the um, handouts at yahoo.com um, if you would like. Uh, um, the handouts. And it's a totally legit mailing list. You can unsubscribe at any time. I'm, I, I don't like to spam people. Um, anyway, so uh, we have a little while um, to have your thoughts, your reflections, questions, what rings true, what doesn't ring true. What have you found to be the most effective ways to free yourself from self-preoccupation? I, I, I'd love to hear, um, I'd love to hear your experiences. Uh, Alexandra. Feel free to unmute yourself. People can unmute themselves now. Please try. Oh, thank you. Um, Dr. Siegel, thank you so much. That was an absolutely lovely talk. 
And um, you can call me Ron, by the way, as, oh, as, as thanks, Ron. Part, of our, um, part of our theme here of Common Humanity. Um, so I'm uh, interested in researching um, uh, group practices, particularly in integration settings. And um, obviously what you're speaking about is kind of the importance of Sangha. And um, I, I'd love to hear you speak a little more about anyone who's researching that where you are and um, what, what you think it promises. Well, I'll tell you, we did, we did a, we, I'm just back from a little, not a randomized control trial, but an interesting exploration research project of, um, we did, uh, we called it Dharma K and it was a, um, a ketamine assisted um, uh, sort of meditative retreat where we got people who have had long time meditation practices and psychedelic experiences together to sort of alternate, um, you know, some meditative explorations and some uh, ketamine assisted explorations. And the fascinating thing, everybody came away with a sense that this is all very powerful, but by far the most powerful thing was the Sangha. Sangha, for those of you not hanging around in Buddhist circles, means uh, community. And uh, a community of like-minded individuals wanting to inch towards sanity. That's not how it's expressed in Buddhist circles, but that's how I would describe it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the kind of, you know, love, connection, and appreciation for one another's honesty and for one another sharing struggles. Because you know, the way that the con connection so, so helps us to get out of the self-esteem addiction. We've all had this when we're with a good friend and we're sharing with a good friend our actual experience, which includes our vulnerabilities, our sense of where we messed up and all that, as well as our triumphs, you know. Um, when we're with a good friend this way, in the moment where both people are sharing honestly, the what are you thinking about me starts to fall away. And in fact, the whole sense of self shifts from me and how am I doing to we. And isn't it cool to be connecting? And, you know, I will say that, you know, contemplative practices and particularly psychedelic practices can really help us shift into that kind of intimacy. So, yeah, the group, whether it's a group of two or, you know, a larger group, uh, absolutely central because one of the ways... I mean, I, you know, I hate to sound culty because certainly situations in which people give up their individuality, you know, I don't know, to follow some madman, you know, that's not a good thing, right? But there's a way of giving up our individuality in the sense of giving up our curated individualities and just being really honest with one another creates a sense of group intimacy, which is very powerful and supports each of us in, in, in stepping off the self-esteem roller coaster. Because it becomes much more, much more meaningful to be honest and connected than it is to be, you know, fancy or look good in some way. So, so thank you, Alexander. Absolutely, Thanks. thank you so much. Other thoughts, reflections. Uh, um, Ron, there is a question that's come up in the chat here um, from mm -hmm. Justin. Just you mentioned that psychedelics weren't great for PTSD or didn't have as complete outcomes. Could you explain what might be missing from what psychedelics do versus what PTSD sufferers need? Um, sorry, that I, I, I said that rather quickly. What I was saying is, at least in the studies with MDMA for PTSD, which are the ones that are furthest along in the United States, that the FDA, it's there, we've completed, we uh, colleagues have completed two um, phase three uh, trials, and we're, you know, we're headed for probably approval for that uh, next year. So when they look at outcome measures, they find that scores on the mystical experience questionnaire and the ego dissolution questionnaire, these various transpersonal measures, don't seem to predict the, the clinical improvement so much. What predicts the clinical improvement is changes in self-compassion measures, that people with PTSD, when they're able to accept and love themselves and not be judging themselves, that seems to be the, the factor that's most powerful. And that happens a lot when people have these MDMA guided MDMA experiences, their self-judgments tend to fall away and they tend to find a way to be much more loving and compassionate uh, toward themselves. And that's what correlates to clinical improvement. So please, I didn't mean to suggest that we're not seeing clinical improvement. 
what I what I meant to suggest is the mediating variable for the clinical improvement isn't so much a transpersonal experience as it is being able to be deeply accepting and of and compassionate toward oneself. Uh, and that's that's kind of the part of the question I was asking. Um, thanks for the answer. That's great. That's exactly what I was after. Um, it sort of was. Uh, but there might be more that you need to say about that. And that's exactly what I was asking for. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, and that I, I have had psychedelic experience and um, it was that part of it that was the most meaningful to me um, through that journey, I suppose. So um, yeah, interesting and validating to hear you say that in that way. So thanks for that. Yeah. I mean, one of the other things that's, that, that is, um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, one of the other pathways that's in the book is um, that I didn't have time to get into is is simply working with our different parts, right? You know, uh, historically, I have a friend who's a um, a minister and uh, uh, also a psychologist, and he says, you know, historically, polytheism is more the norm than monotheism. It crops up a lot because uh, throughout human history, because it it represents our experience, right? That that um, if you were to interview my wife um about uh how um angry ron is compared to anxious ron and how they are compared to generous ron and compassionate ron and how they are compared to hungry ron although hungry ron is somewhat related to angry ron which is why we have the word hangry at least in american english now but you know it, it, you know it's like she's got a polyandrous relationship right because we're so different in these different moments when different parts of us are kind of taking over. And part of what happens, part of where the self-compassion leads is toward really accepting all of these different parts, right? Accepting the insecure parts, accepting the wounded parts, accepting the valiant parts, accepting the parts that are super capable and competent, and, you know, the, the whole thing. Can we accept all of these different parts? And, um, you know, self-compassion certainly connects to this. And there's an interesting connection because when we really, really accept all the different parts, and we really see all these different parts manifesting, we start to realize, oh, well, there's, there isn't exactly a me in here. There's just the manifestation of these different parts and something of a wise and compassionate intelligence that we can tap into. But that wise and compassionate intelligence is not very personal. It doesn't feel like Ron. It feels like wisdom and compassion showing up. So there's an interesting relationship between transpersonal awareness and really accepting all these different parts of ourselves, which is why the, the mystical experience questionnaire has internal unity as one of the things it's measuring. Where it, These are all uh, different ways of, of, I think, describing a unitary phenomena. Laura. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Laura. I'm studying psychology currently in Spain online and I'm in my third year. And I wanted to know if you think behavioral cognitive therapy is compatible with the transpersonal experience. Uh, bienvenida. Um, Gracias. The, uh, um, uh, that's an interesting question. I, I will say there are people who are trying to look at how cognitive behavior therapy might be used as a framework for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So it's on the table. Um, <laughs> That said, and cognitive behavior therapy certainly does help us to develop what's called metacognitive awareness, which is basically perspective on thoughts, to see thoughts as thoughts rather than realities, which is one of the things that we discover in psychedelic work. It's one of the things we discover in meditative practices, and it's one of the things that it's one of the the um, the benefits of, of transpersonal awakening is we get very skeptical about our thoughts because we start to see that, well, the opposite mm -hmm. is also true of every polarity. So there are certainly synergies. And on the other hand, a lot of traditional CBT um, uh, emphasizes trying to get cognition right. Um, third, you know, in other words, traditional CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, was about changing maladaptive, irrational thoughts into rational, adaptive ones. When you get into the third wave of, of CBT, and these are things like dialectical behavior therapy, things like um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, these kinds of developments, then there's much more of an emphasis on seeing thoughts as thoughts coming and going. And to the extent to which we're learning to see thoughts as 
as thoughts coming and going, that's quite compatible with developing a transpersonal perspective and developing um, uh, um, a, uh, um, a sense of deep acceptance. I think the, so I think older CBT is probably less compatible ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, which arguably is a form of cognitive behavior therapy, is super compatible with uh, psychedelic and meditative work. And uh, there's all sorts of people trying to use it for preparation and integration. So, so it sort of depends on which certain kinds of CBT are an easier fit than others, I'd say, um, mm -hmm. though they all have the potential to have some use. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Ron, there's a question that a couple of are asking in the chat, I guess, to, to piggyback and expand on that one. And maybe we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what approaches, uh, other approaches to therapy that you do find, feel personally are particularly relevant or particularly work well in conjunction with psychedelics. This, this is, I think, one of the next frontiers, right? Because up until now, um, almost all the controlled studies have used what we might call the sort of Stan Groff approach, um, more or less that comes from the, the first wave of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which is to provide a supportive presence to hold space and to allow the natural healing intelligence to manifest. Um, the way this is described, for example, in ayahuasca journeys is, you know, let mother ayahuasca show you what she needs to show you, a kind of, a kind of reverence for letting go of control and allowing the process to unfold and just trusting that the, that the, the heart, mind, brain have a natural healing proclivity. Uh, and it, you know, in, in psychotherapeutic terms, it, it looks kind of Rogerian in a lot of ways, like Carl Rogers, for those of you who are therapists. Um, but people are saying, hey, look, we do know that things like acceptance and commitment therapy, things like uh, internal family systems, uh, where things like the third wave of CBT really do help people with anxiety, with depression, with other, other really debilitating um, uh, psychological struggles. So can't there be a synergy? Might we add these therapies to whatever the natural, nat natural healing intelligence is and what, what's manifesting um, spontaneously? And could we get even better results? Ultimately, it's an empirical question. I don't know if we're going to be able to measure it well or not, but there are people beginning to study that. And the the um, uh, the low hanging fruit here, or, or the ones that seem most compatible, are things like ACT acceptance commitment therapy, which is really about radical acceptance. You know, can I accept everything? And interestingly, in ACT, it's about can I identify with awareness itself rather than with my narrative about me, rather than my thoughts about me being good or bad or talented or not, or, or a good person or a bad person, identify with this consciousness itself. But you can see there's an obvious synergy there. Uh, the parts work that you see in internal family systems has an obvious synergy because people start to notice these different parts of themselves with psychedelics. And they very often will spontaneously say, oh God, you know, it feels like there's this part of me that is so young and is so frightened and that I've hidden, I've, I've hidden for my whole life. The, the part starts to talk. So that, that seems like a very natural fit. And I would say mindfulness oriented Treatment, uh, treatments are a really natural fit because the principles of mindfulness and the principles of psychedelic assisted work, uh, um, they're totally synergistic. When I think of um, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Bill Richards, who is the, the last psychologist to legally administer psilocybin in a research study in the United States, and he's in his 80s now, and he says, you know, the principle then is the same as the principle now. Um, you know, whatever is happening, um, uh, trust, let go, and open to the experience. That's what we're doing here. Well, what's mindfulness about? Awareness of present experience with acceptance. It's the same thing. So, you know, so clearly there's a synergy there. And, and most people who do psychedelic guiding or therapy have a sense that their own mindfulness practice allows them to be more present, to show up, to hold space. So th those are the ones that I think are are most obvious, but you know, we'll see. I mean, all, all sorts of things are 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 possible. I'm fantastic. Thanks, thanks so much, Ron. I'm wary of time as our, as we're hitting our scheduled our scheduled end time. I noticed Kyle had his hand up. Ron, if you have an extra couple of minutes, would you be happy to answer one more question before we wrap up? Sure, sure. Thank you, Ron. That was amazing. Um. My question, I suppose, is about what your suggest or what your perspective is around, you know, what's happening now in obviously the 1st of July, the schedule of 
these drugs is changing in Australia. I watched a really fascinating documentary called Trafficked um, a couple of weeks ago, and it was all about marijuana in America and how even though it was legalized, especially in California, the black market for that has just exploded just because of how much regulation is now in place, how hard it is for like growers to, you know, do the, all these permits and then for places to actually sell it according to all of the, the, the requirements. I read somewhere that apparently one a, a treatment in Australia could cost upwards of $25,000, um, which is obviously quite expensive. I was just curious on your perspective of, you know, there is a lot of pressure in, in getting this right um, to ensure that it can continue along um, this progress. I'd just be curious to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, you know, um, I'm not very good at predicting the future. Um, the uh, um, and I'm not even sure. I, there's this uh, there's a children's book in America called "If I Ran the Zoo," and I think and you know it's about if I ran the zoo, how would I structure the world? If I ran the zoo, I'm not sure what's optimal here because there there are so many dynamic tensions that they feel like they're about competing goods. You know, on the one hand, having this democratized and relatively readily available and not super expensive and all of that. Well, that sounds like a good thing. But on the other hand, these are really powerful medicines. And I know, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old geezer now. I've been in the psychotherapy world for many decades. And I have seen firsthand that bad psychotherapy is really, really damaging to people. Well, bad psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is going to be even more damaging because people are super opened up. Um, so we kind of need people to be well-trained, but the more you insist on training people very, very thoroughly, the more expensive things get because, you know, that, that's resource intensive. The, the underground world is, you know, is more accessible, more democratic, but it's also so unregulated. I really fear, you know, for these, these situations and many stories have surfaced of, you know, the archetype is um, somebody, usually a guy, is, uh, you know, sort of living in, in his parents' basement, not quite getting his life together in terms of love and work, uh, and, you know, has some amazing psychedelic experiences and then fancies himself a shaman and starts guiding others and gets terribly narcissistically inflated when people say, oh, you know, you're the greatest thing ever. You're turning me on to, you know, infinite universes I never knew were, were you know, existed. And the person says, yes, I can do this. I have this. And then you're in this intimate relationship with somebody for hours on end. You know, you think that's a ripe opportunity for things to go off the rails, particularly in sexually exploitive situations sure is and it happens and it's all underground so there's no way to you know to police this so i don't know i don't know what's optimal because that's you know it's a huge tension um this way i mean certainly putting people in jail for this is lunacy but these are really powerful medicines and like what we have an, an initiative in oregon the a state in the northwest of the united states that has just opened the first doors where you know, the training is 140 hours and the, the prerequisite for being a trainer, for being a guide with psilocybin is a high school diploma. And a high school diploma plus 140 hours, of which only 40 have to be in person, I, I, I you know, I think 100 can be online, to me doesn't seem like sufficient training to work with people who've been through trauma, people who may have major mental illness for, that doesn't seem right. Um, that seems really scary. And the fact that it's state sanctioned because these people get licensed, that's that sort of that sort of implies that it's okay and we know it's safe. Well, we don't know it's safe. I, I don't know what's going to happen there. But then again, to have it all illegal, that doesn't make sense. So I I don't know um uh you know what the answer is. And maybe it makes sense to do the rollout with more highly trained people in the medical and healthcare system for a while and see if we can learn and get our bearings and then find ways to disseminate it more and make it more available to people with with less means. But I, I'm just guessing here. And of course, you know, I have my own biases and prejudices. I happen to be a mental health professional. So I think that, you know, we should be the, you know, we should be the stewards. But, you know, if, if you come from uh, the, um, 
you know, Santa Daime Church or any one of a, a lot of other traditions, you're going to say, well, wait, we should be the stewards. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, amazing. Amazing. Thanks so much, Ron. Um, and thanks, Carl, for asking that question. I might even it's just... It's a great question. It is a great one. I might even just add as one brief comment, um, Carl, as you commented on some of the commentary that has taken place talking about treatments of costing $25,000 plus. Um, from the calculations that we've done, it doesn't look as though it will hit those numbers. It does look somewhere more likely to be in the realm of ten to fifteen thousand, which is still expensive, but but less so. Um, but it is a it is a question, and I don't know for the affordability challenge and the affordability questions is, I think, a really key one that we're going to have to consider as it goes forward and as this as these therapies become available and become regulated in Australia. Um, however, we have. And Scott, got if I may say one comment with that, and Carl. As part of that strategy, we have launched launched a, a patient support fund, so we will um, offset the cost of treatments as they become more more, I guess, widely rolled out. And how that will work still has to play out because again, I know come first of July, um, yeah, I guess there's still this funnel neck from the TGA as to who's a, who is, who is going to become an authorized prescriber and ethics approvals and all of that stuff. But fingers crossed. Will be there every step of the way, yeah. and and it's going to be an iterative process, right? We're 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 all going right. to learn something. Some things are going to go well, and some things aren't going to go so well, and we're we're all going to learn from yeah. that. And yeah. hopefully, the things that don't go so well will be more, will be you know not about safety issues, but more about you know how how do we optimally get this out to um, as many people as possible in in a safer way as possible. Right. Amazing. So well said, Ron. Um, I, I, just, I just put in the chat the handouts at yahoo.com. If you want it, you can just click on that. By the way, it's, it's, it's going up quickly, but there it is. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ron, for your time and for spending this time with us. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, and thank, thank you. you. I, 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 hope, I hope to be there in person at some point. I'll, Ian, I'll, I'll reach out to you because I'm, I'm going to be in your neighborhood as, as close as Indonesia uh, next year. It might be fun to drop in if there's a way to do that. But, but Ron, speak to Scott about that. We'd love to have you. Yeah, fantastic. You're on workshop or two. <laughs> Let, let's let's keep in touch. We would absolutely love to host you. So we'll have to um we'll have to keep in touch and talk about it as you as you firm up your dates and your plans around that. Sounds good. And also we will email Ron slides to everybody as well. Yeah, I'll get them to you. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Um it's been an absolute pleasure and I uh, will see you all. We'll see you all on the next one. Fantastic. Thank you everybody for coming.